Today, we're really lucky to have Wale Sabre. He's the Digital Accessibility Coordinator at New York City Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication. You want to say hello, Wale? Hi, everyone. I'm Wale. Um, so I'm the Digital Accessibility Coordinator for the City of New York. My job uh, is to assist 100 plus city agencies in making their digital content accessible. So that's our websites, our electronic documents, videos, social media posts, apps, whatever it is. Um, I'm there to help them make it accessible by auditing, training, or creating guidance materials. Great, thanks, Wale. And then next we have Thomas Logan, the co-founder and CEO of Eagle Entry. Want to say hello, Thomas? Yeah. Give a brief little intro as well. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I have CEO of Influentry. I've worked my whole career in this space of accessibility. So when I graduated from university with computer science, I was fortunate about 15 years ago to get kind of involved in this accessible technology idea. And I've been passionate about it ever since I learned you know, what technology can do for accessibility. Um, I'm also a meetup co-organizer here in the, the city. So if you haven't heard of our meetup, Accessibility New York City, meetup.com slash A11Y, NYC. Uh, we meet monthly and have interesting accessibility discussions. And next we have Eugene Gilbert, the adjunct professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering, um, and also uh, does some usability uh, and UX stuff as well. So you want to say hello and do a quick intro as well? Hello everyone, my name is Regine Gilbert. I am uh, president of Gilbert Consulting Group and I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU teaching user experience design. My accessibility uh, background includes a really strong passion for it as well as I've weaved it into my classes and in the companies that I've worked with in the past, I've created accessibility, accessibility guidelines and done trainings uh, associated with accessibility. All right. Amazing, and again, as I mentioned before, I mean, how lucky are we at Seamless Docs when we're looking for, for help with crafting our own accessibility journey, we were able to find these amazing professionals. Um, our goal is to see how can we package some of this up as much as possible, but with that being said, there's nothing that's gonna substitute their expertise, so we're gonna continue to tap into that and we encourage uh, everyone to do the same. So, uh, so our digital playbook. Again, going into SEMA stocks, what happened with us is that some, you know, for a long time, people were like, oh, are your forms like you know, ADA and 508 compliant? And I'm not sure we knew entirely what that meant. I'm not sure a lot of people know entirely what that means. I cannot tell you the amount of companies I go to that build forms online that list 508 and ADA compliance as one of the things they do. And it will not take you long to either check their website or build a form or find a sample form to know that it actually isn't compliant. And to me, I don't think this is anything malicious. I just think it's just they did not necessarily say that accessibility is a first principle. So even with us, when we first started, what did we want to do? We're like, well, what do we, have? we have to make sure that all of our web forms pass a compliance test. Now, for all of you here talking about accessibility strategy, that was what we thought was the first step, was making sure they were compliant. And we quickly realized that that was far from the first step. We actually now, it's actually number seven uh, now, or even seven and nine in terms of where it crept. There's so much more involved with creating a comprehensive accessibility strategy. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through each play and then we'll have the panelists kind of give their own opinion and feedback and expertise, which is, so I, I could not be more excited for this right now. Great, so play number one, build empathy and culture. So it starts with making a commitment uh, and ensuring your team even understands what accessibility is. So one of the things, I know I've talked to, to each of you, uh, actually a little bit less regime, about you know, building a culture of accessibility. You know, what are some, some tips of the trade or for those that, people in the audience, if they're trying to create an a culture of accessibility, how, how do you create that? And then my second part of that question is also, what if they already are creating a culture of accountability or a culture of fill in the blank? Like, can you, can you create a culture of accessibility if it's not a, a first principle? So, Wale, you wanna take that first? Absolutely. Um, so I actually consider the 
this to be the most important part of my uh, position and duties in terms of you know building an, uh, a culture of accessibility in city government. And I do that by you know many different things. You know whether it's by training um, our developers or content creators um, and trying to make those trainings also just engaging and fun and not just like informative, obviously informative though. Um, and we try to also, um, you know, make it, uh, well, to, to, to just kind of uh, build programming around accessibility. So it's not just me always reaching out to people saying, you know, an agency and, and letting them know, hey, your website is not accessible, let's work on this. Uh, we have a digital inclusion group that we've created uh, for city employees and we actually create um, programming for them, whether it's like how to create an accessible form or we had an entire lesson on describing images and alt text or uh, more recently we had one on actually a webinar uh, that was provided by Adobe on creating accessible PDFs. So these are things that they're already looking for because you know they do know that they have to comply uh, with laws and guidelines. Um, on top of that you know, we, we do try to make accessibility sexy. And um, the way that we do that is we had a conference last year. Uh, our conference was a digital inclusion and accessibility conference. It, um, uh, it was for city employees last year. And we had about 200 people show up uh, and learn all about accessibility and uh, whether it's making your multimedia content accessible or designing for older adults or even in the inclusion space. How do you represent marginalized groups in a respectful and authentic way? And it was a huge hit. And uh, this year we have our second um, annual uh, conference. We're changing the name. It's a Digital Inclusion Conference or DICON. And it's this Thursday and we are opening it up to the public this year. Unfortunately, tickets are sold out, but we are live streaming it. So folks are, you know, can join, uh, join us and, and learn about this uh, Field. And amazing. And what's the website if they want to learn more about DICON this year? Uh, we created um, a short URL for it because our URL isn't great. But uh, if you want, you can try a, a bit.ly, bit.ly slash DICON19. That's D I C O N 19. Great. And thank you so much. So it sounds like what I heard there was around just programming. I mean, I think Wale helped us shape our own accessibility uh, culture at Seamus Talks. We do at least one event a month surrounding something around accessibility, so we're on programming. Uh, we do one larger event like this every quarter. And then ongoing education. I will say, regardless what type of culture you want to build, repeating that word over and over again. And I'm really proud that you can walk into our office any day, and even if I'm not there, and you can turn to any person at our company and be like, hey, you know, what are some of your number one initiatives this year? And every single person will say accessibility. And I guess that's my challenge to people in the audience if, as you're thinking about crafting accessibility culture, is that you know, would someone do that at your company? And is that really a number one priority? Or is that just something oh, oh, only one division worries about that, only like one to two people? I do think creating that culture of accessibility, and it's been fascinating because it's not just the team, it's not just the sales team, the solutions team, like our engineers now are coming and asking certain questions as well. So again, we're really excited about that. So in addition to programming, so whether it's events, whether it's education, anything else, Thomas or Regine, you could add to like, if you want to create a culture of empathy and accessibility? Oh, well, I have a question for everybody. Who do you think about the most? Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> I personally do. Okay. Most of us think about ourselves the most. And so when we start with empathy, it's really hard for us to think about somebody that's not ourselves. And whatever it is that you're creating, whatever product you're creating, whatever service you're offering, you want to think about who you're excluding from the start. This is a way that I've uh, started to approach after I read Kat Holmes' book, Mismatch Design to think about who are you excluding from the very beginning. 
because we are always thinking about ourselves or because we are thinking about what our company needs, we tend to not think about who are we leaving out from the very beginning. And oftentimes it is people with disabilities uh, and minorities. So we, wanna, we want to make sure that we kind of take ourselves out of ourselves and think about other people from the very beginning. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. And I think that, I mean, I, I think it's for us even and for a lot of people, I mean, how many of you people have a product and you only want to build for 80% of your constituents? I mean, and that's ultimately what you're doing by excluding uh, people with disabilities is you're actually saying that 20% of the U.S. identifies with some level of disability. And I don't think anyone wants to do that. And I th we have a saying, you know, access for all. And I think that even at Seamless Docs, we actually no longer think about it just for building people with disabilities. It's how do we build for everybody? And that's the attitude that we want to take, is that, all right, when we're doing this, is this accessible for everybody? And just to, uh, uh, actually with Charlie, our, our lead designer is here tonight, you know, actually me and him recently had a discussion where it was like, all right, we can go and build it this way, which will actually be more accessible. It was actually for a drop-down menu. And I'm not sure, I mean, drop-down menu, we think, we think more about drop-down menus, I promise, than everyone here combined. Uh, and it was this thing where like, all right, we can do the default drop-down menu and that will be more accessible. But I was like, I don't like using a default drop-down menu. And not, neither did a lot of other people. So instead, it was way harder. So we had to go and spend, instead of spending like two hours doing this, we, we, it prob we were probably going to end up spending 120 hours doing it. But guess what? We were able to build one that's also accessible but is more beautiful and is great and has all those shortcuts that you, everyone likes in this room when you start using a drop-down menu and we've thought about all those. And so that's a good example of access for all. Yet because it's now in our culture, if we had just said we're a culture for building people with disabilities, that wouldn't have been enough. It's about building for everybody. So uh, Thomas, anything else to add in terms of building a, a great culture? Yeah, I think just one quick idea is, you know, depending on the organization you work for, looking around the room, uh, do you have colleagues, do you have teammates on your team that have disabilities? You know, it's not about um, this idea of like, hey, disclose we have a disability, but talking to your HR team, talking to the people that are part of going to job fairs, actually saying, are you reaching out to communities where, you know, people with disabilities are hearing about job opportunities where you work? Because I think one of the biggest ways I've seen change in organizations is when it's not about, oh, we're doing this feature for those people. It's like you have teammates, you have colleagues, you really understand it on a human and social level. So I think that's, that's another I point. actually would like to underscore that. I think the best uh, strategy is you guys, you know, fo folks need to hire people with disabilities. You need people with disabilities in your organizations because if, you're design if you want to include people with disabilities in your design, we are the end user. So I'm a person, I identify as a person with a disability, I'm blind, uh, and that informs a lot of my work, and it informs a lot of, you know, you know there's no way if I'm testing something I could cheat, right? Like, the, I can't just do that. I definitely get to that barrier, right, and experience it for myself, and I will want to change it. And I'll, I'll also be motivated to go beyond that. Yeah, so all great points, and I think that brings us to our next play, which is, established ownership and commitment. Uh, so at Seamus Stocks, we were lucky enough, um, as you heard, Thomas Logan, Mikkel Entry, we brought him on as, as our part-time or interim, as we like to say, chief access officer. I'm not sure if that's a common title or we made it up. Uh, I like to think we made it up, uh, or we coined it, I should say. Um, I'd like to see that becoming more, more and more common. Uh, you know, I think that that is a large part in terms of every, everything they just said, right, is while, while they said, if you have a commitment to this, then guess what? Like, you now need to make this part of your hiring process if that's part of your commitment. So I think in general, it's not just that commitment is important, but also the other piece is so, so important. And why it's number play number two is establishing ownership. Right, we talked before about this accessibility portal and this alley bar, uh, A11 bar, but like, if no one is in charge of responding to those, then guess what happens? Like, unfortunately, too many of these comments is that they won't be returned, and they won't be. So you need to establish that ownership. And so I guess, we, you know, with that being said, we were lucky enough to have enough resources, but I guess my question to the panel is, you know, New York City is lucky enough to have resources and have someone like Wale. 
Um, and I believe even while Lay was appointed, he was one of the first digital accessibility off like, coordinators in the country. Um, so New York City leading the way. But if you don't have those resources, maybe for people in the room tonight that you know, they need to leverage their existing staff or you know, how can they establish ownership within the organization or appoint someone to be an interim ADA coordinator or an, ADA, like an access officer? You know, what recommendations do you have for them for establishing ownership around accessibility? So um, for the city of New York, we started, our journey started when um, we passed the law in 2016. Uh, and our, our journey, meaning just our current journey for accessibility, uh, digital accessibility. Uh, in 2016, we actually passed a local law, uh, local law 26 of 2016, which required our city agencies to make their websites accessible. It also requires us to submit a report um, on the compliance of our websites every two years. So now we have this uh, requirement, a local requirement, right? The ADA already required it. But now, because uh, you know, we're more locally oriented, uh, city agencies are, this is now on their radar. So uh, as a commitment, that is, uh, that is our sort of commitment, is, is through this law and um, fulfilling this law, right? And we, we published our first report on, in 2017. Part of the law was to appoint a designee uh, to oversee this process. And that's how the digital accessibility coordinator position was created and also adopting standards, right? So um, we were tasked with adopting standards, so we initially uh, adopted WCAG 2.0, level AA, because that was um, what was uh, you know, used at the time, and now we're sort of working on transitioning to 2.1 and incorporating that into our processes. Great, anything else, Thomas or Gene, to add around you know, establishing ownership within an organization around accessibility? I mean, I think it, one thing would be important, maybe if someone here is interested in doing that for your organization and not doing that already, is making sure that leadership does understand, hey, this is a commitment, like when someone is getting assigned this role, this can't be like a 10% thing. It's like, hey, I wanna do accessibility or if we're making this commitment, the understanding that that is a commitment, that's a time commitment, and Jonathan said, you're gonna be receiving feedback, you're gonna be, someone's gonna be working and working with different teams in an organization. So I think it's important that, you know, really having that be understood that this is not something I can do in like my 10% time if, you're, if that was gonna be taken. I think that's an important point. I think, you know, coming from my experience, it needs to come from leadership. That first initiative needs to come from leadership because there, there are often way too many situations where Somebody who's more like entry level is trying to advocate for it, but none of the higher ups are listening. Yeah, and I would, from my past life, um, I would say that it is very difficult when people don't know what accessibility is. I mean, people up here, uh, if you say WCAG, how many in this room know what that is by show of hands, right? Not a lot of you. So that stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So just, I, I would say baseline, it's getting the education. You definitely need leadership buy-in. If you do not have that, you will, you will go nowhere. So you need to have that. And then it's an education process. It's an education process for all the teams that are involved in developing um, your product. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I would say that Again, we work with hundreds of governments and we're starting to work with even more. Um, I can tell you that a lot of governments, they've, like in Minnesota, uh, Max, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I think it's in Minnesota, the communications director has now become widely known that he, that person should, ex should be in charge of ADA um, or accessibility issues. Um, in other states, it's the clerk that's responsible. So again, I think that's something, and then from an organization perspective, um, and if this is something you're interested in, I encourage you in you know, maybe finding an existing position as a start and then, then going to leadership uh, to try to say, okay, this is something that, that we need. I mean, again, as I mentioned, we brought on uh, Thomas. He's usually in like a day or two a week, but you know, that's, that he's really helping us at the highest level to implement this and making sure that our product and other things. But we're also appointing people at, uh, on the response level, making sure our support is, respon is responsive as well. 
I will say that from like a resource allocation perspective, I don't, I think you can do this without having a full-time employee. I think you can do this without having a full-time resource initially, again, depending on your needs as an organization. And I do think that like, not having enough resources shouldn't be an excuse enough for not being able to do some of the stuff we're talking about today. If I also can share, there are a lot of free resources out there on the internet from uh, W3C, which is the World Wide Web Consortium. They created WCAG 2.0. Uh, the City of New York, we've actually created um, a digital blueprint. It's a website uh, where we have our digital accessibility toolkit uh, free and available for download. So those are all things you can always try to connect with me and if you can manage to be lucky enough to find some time with me, I can, you know, give you guys some time and, uh, you know, maybe a call or, you know, we did trainings for Seamless Docs, right? So we, we were able to do that. Obviously, my main focus is to help city agencies, but if I'm making New York City a more accessible city, I will do that whenever I have the time. Yeah. And yeah. It seems I'm going to I'm I'm plug, uh, because I have a book coming out toward the end of the year on inclusive design and accessibility, so be on the lookout for that. All right, love that. Um, yeah, so I think that, like, I think this is something that we, we also want to encourage to see in the stock, so with Eugene's book, or uh, we're also working on facilitating and curating some content ourselves. Um, around accessibility. We actually found a lot of platforms weren't even fully accessible, so we actually built our own. Um, so we're working on some of this simple stuff. So some of those things were mentioned, like what are the basics of WCAG? Uh, what's the basis of 508, ADA? Some of these terms that are pretty common in accessibility but might not mean anything to you. So we're working on that. And if anyone is interested in helping us, we're going to open source all that content. Um, that is something that Seamus Docs, again, is facilitating this journey. Our goal is for each one of these plays to have a resource to accommodate it. So with that being said, the next one, I talked about the accessibility portal. I talked about having a, a templated accessibility statement that we have. Um, play number three is creating a policy and statement. I would although say that creating a policy and statement does not involve copying and pasting someone else's accessibility uh, statement. Um, I mean, we, even when Thomas and I worked on this, for like maybe three months. Um, and it was like every time we went and sat down, I think we like stripped out like another sentence or another, it was like that's not their words, that's like our words. Um, and I think that it's something to be thoughtful about, right, is like your accessibility statement and your policy around this should be a guiding force between your, behind your organization. It should be a benchmark for you to point to. I don't think many accessibility statements are, right? So if you are really, it, it should be, if your statement is that you're WCAG 2.0, then guess what, you have to be WCAG 2.0. If you're not, you don't know what that is, but you're committed in like looking into it, then you should say that. And, and I think ultimately it's just saying it's an ongoing pro uh, process. So with that being said, you know, in crafting accessibility statement, you know, this is a wide array of perspective here, like everything from New York City, that's a very serious accessibility statement, obviously, in policy, versus you know, from a consulting perspective and from a user experience perspective, you know, what, how do you create, what value are you trying to create when you create an accessibility policy and you know, how much thought should even be put behind it in general? Maybe like Regine, you want to start at the other end this time? Oh, okay. Uh, so I think you need to be, as you said, you need to be clear on what the intent of the statement is. So if a lot of times these statements come out after somebody's been sued, many times. Uh, so what they'll come out and say is that we're working on the website. Right, we are working on making it uh, single A, double A, or triple, you know, nobody does triple A, um, double A compliant. So that's what you'll want to say. Uh, you just want to be clear with the intent from the beginning, like you said. Yeah. Anyone else? I mean, this one's not the most exciting, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll I, need some time. I'll, oh, uh, I'll add a quick little note. I think transparency is, yeah. is very key here, and um, I would rather and I know a lot of organizations hesitate to do this, and even, I'll be frank with you guys, I've had a lot of trouble getting approval to get an accessibility statement for nyc.gov, but uh, in, in, in crafting an accessibility commitment or statement, I really appreciate honesty. And if I see a statement that says, we're working on this, this, and that, and here's one thing that we've had trouble we can't fix, but here's an alternative, right? Uh, you can email this person, you can call this person. That to me is an effective accessibility statement as opposed to the one, you know, the CYA version, which is just, you know, there for legal purposes to say, 
we strive to comply <laughs> with WCAG 2.0 or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that transparency, if anything we've learned in accessibility, just being honest, right? Like we don't have a solution for this yet, but we're working on it. Uh, and, and then, but if you're being honest, it also means like following up too, right? So you can't say, oh, we'll have this in three months and then three, like six months later you have nothing. So next one, in an interest of time, we'll go, maybe go a little bit quicker. Um, on collecting and tracking feedback, uh, this one I sp spoke a lot about tonight, right? I mean, we literally built two tools and spent you know, a lot of R&D dollars and consulting dollars and kind of crafting these. We obviously think the feedback mechanism is probably most important. And by the way, like, I think Regine will probably back me up on this. When it comes to any usability, you know, feedback is, is that's number one, right? Whether you're building a, a new app and you want like user-centric design or just having a way to collect feedback and having that online, I think is so crucial. So maybe just like a quick uh, snippet in this, maybe Regine too on the user experience perspective around co how important is collecting and tracking feedback when crafting any policy, especially accessibility policy. Uh, from a usability standpoint, I can't do my job without feedback. Uh, and when you are involving uh, accessibility, you have to make sure that you are going out and actually speaking with uh, people with disabilities and not just you know faking it like so many do. So you really wanna be uh, genuine in who you're approaching about getting that feedback and how you are going about it. Um, I think the way that you all have gone about it and, and incorporated it in, into the forms and everything else is really great. Um, there are so many different plugins you can use for feedback across the board. So I, I personally could not do my job without feedback. As a user experience designer, you are the user advocate and you need that feedback in order to, to do your job. Yeah, I'd say this is the one that I'm you know, the most excited about you know, coming from Seamless Docs because I do consulting across so many different organizations, frequently people experiencing lawsuits, right? And there's been a whole huge exponential increase in litigation that's happening in this area, but it's frequently focused not on the user experience, it's on the technical requirements of WCAG 2.0, double A. Oh, you didn't meet this success criterion. Oh, this is a risk. And it's like, what does that mean to the experience of the user? I think it's not, a, it's not the way we want this to be. We really want and the goal with this type of feature is like really making sure you collect feedback, make it easy, make it really consistent. There's an easy way for people to send that feedback in. It's going to be way more motivating for people in your organization to work on real problems or know that this is something that is affecting someone. And it also, once it gets fixed, is a nice motivator to be able to show, hey, we received this feedback. This is a real issue someone was experiencing. Here's how we thought about it. Here's how we solved it, and it's that's a lot more exciting than uh, you know. Now we're not sued because we did WCAG two double A. You know. But I will say, from a liability perspective, I mean, you're going to get a lawsuit when someone you you don't get lawsuits when people are like happy, like oh they took care of that. Like you get when they when they when they're pissed and they can't find that. So even from a liability perspective, just having an accessibility statement, having these forms having a way for them to, a mechanism for them to give in line, like I'm having an issue on this page and I can let you know, hey, I'm having an issue on this page and then acknowledging it, you know, is, forget about just all the other benefits of like fixing the problem and understanding the problem, but also just remediating the problem and, and hearing people is so, so important regardless of whatever your organization might do. So next play is gonna be examine analytics, right? So. Uh, again, I can see Eugene's light, uh, eyes lighting up in this one too, I'm sure. Another key part of user experience, but maybe Thomas, if you could start on this, just you know, one of the things that, you know, I know you work with a lot of large organizations, a lot of governments. I mean, we work with one government recently, they had 96,000 PDFs, all right? Um, how do you, which, which PDF do you start first? Right. And I think, and honestly, this was, we, I remember asking that question, they like, they're like, uh, what do you mean? And it was like, well, like, oh, let's start with the simple ones. And it was like, wait a minute, like, is that really the best way? Like, shouldn't we have analytics on these PDFs? Like, maybe we should start with the one that's used the most, because that's going to, you know, have the most value. So how can you incorporate analytics? Um, you know, just, again, we have Google Analytics is just probably the easiest way to do this. It's, we have a tool called Seamless Reports that allows you to create a dashboard to visualize some of these. 
Um, but regardless, I mean, maybe Thomas, you could start with this and just, you know, how do you use analytics to kind of craft a strategy around remediation or, or helping ongoing solve uh, an accessibility issue? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really the only logical way to do it when you don't get this feedback mechanism right from the community and you don't have knowledge of like, well, where, where are the things that people are needing? It's like, well, you have to go logically from understanding what pages have been accessed the most or what pages historically have been requested. Like if, if something was requested uh, a month ago or two months ago, like a type of document, it's more likely that that type of document is going to be requested again in the future. So having some way to be more, you know, analytical about where you're choosing to devote resources because, you know, unfortunately, the lawyers want to say, let's just be totally WCAG 2 AA, and it's not, it's not possible, right? Like, you can't actually with this mountain do that. So this is one way to say, explain a strategy, and actually, again, for maybe in your organizations talking with the leadership team, it's like you de defining a budget, defining what can be done, having this information as a, as a way to influence, here's how we're choosing what we focus on. You know, I think that's part that a lot of companies don't have that. So they can't make those kind of accurate decisions. Great. And I'll say one thing not to do. This is a true story. There was one municipality in Florida we were working with. And instead of looking at their analytics, they just took down the website. Um, I mean, that's not, that's not the way to handle this either, right? I mean, I think ultimately it's, you know, just hiding the issue is not going to make this, this go away, obviously. So um, great. So next is play number six, which is uh, implement and provide basic training. So. We talked a little bit about this. Um, I wrote a Wale for this question. Uh, as he mentioned, he was generous enough to give us two training sessions, not just one. One was on just digital accessibility 101. One was on just etiquette. Uh, in general, like, this is really hard. New York City's big. You're the only digital accessibility coordinator. How do you go ahead and even think about providing training and access to training and basics around accessibility to a city as large as New York City? Well, um we, we just, we, we try to train as many agencies as possible and really, my, you know, going back to just that building that culture of accessibility, you know, it, it's really, I can't be the one person to do it all on my own. I'm one person and like I said, we have over 100 agencies. We employ almost 300,000 people. So it's pretty unrealistic to, know, to think that I'll be getting to, you know, to train everybody, uh, you know, in the next decade, maybe. Um, but uh, what we, you know, what I do uh, do is, you know, try to train the important folks, uh, you know, meaning folks who whose work is touched by access digital accessibility, right? So I will uh, train developers, and I will create a customized training for developers that's a little bit more uh, technical and. and you know, deep. Uh, it, it, then I will have more of an introductory um, um, training where it's like it's more for a, a group of people. It might you might have some comms folks there? You might have some content creators. You might have some developers. You might have some social media <coughs> professionals there, right? And kind of keeping it high level, more about the concepts. And always, always, we try to make the you know trainings as engaging as possible, whether it's by uh, me showing off how a screen reader works um, and I will try to customize the trainings to that organization so I might actually show you your own website and how it reads with a screen reader and you know maybe make fun of you for misspelling people with dis disabilities um, on your alt text right um, and, and you know we try to make it engaging and fun in that way but also to, to have various versions of the trainings, you know, geared towards whoever. So uh, most recently, the most interesting training that we've worked on is video accessibility. We did an audio description training, uh, and we had, you know, uh, folks who work with multimedia or videos come in and learn all about that. And once, you know, once we started training enough folks, they, tr they themselves started sharing that knowledge with other people in their organizations. Um, at Do It Now, we actually have uh, had folks uh, that train, um, not myself, but they actually train other agencies on how to make their, use our uh, content management system, TeamSite, 
to make their websites accessible if they are on that platform. And we've trained actually 74 agencies. And that's separate from all of the work that I've been doing. Wow. And then also, let's not forget uh, Renee or Jean's book is coming out. Uh, what was that called again? Oh, it'll be uh, the title, tentative title right now is Inclusive Design in the Digital Age, Designing with Accessibility in Mind. Um, and I just want to say in regards to training, um, it's really helpful that you do have a couple of experts, you know, there in-house uh, because that's helpful. But what's really important is that everybody understands what their role is. So if you're on the copy team, how are you writing uh, accessible copy? If you're on the dev team, like what are you doing? If you're a visual designer, if you're UX. So all of those areas need to know exactly what their role is and that's a big part of the training, not only having the buy-in from leadership, some um, experts in-house, but also knowing letting people know what their role is in it because it really is everyone's responsibility at the end of the day. Yeah. And even on this, like in our basic training, we included empathy. That was, we had empathy training, right? Like I think we had a whole session on just understanding, you know, the scope of, of accessibility and people with disabilities and understanding how do you classify these things and then just the basics and the law. And then as we said, the, going to the technical as well. So going into play number seven, um, this is, this, this one's a little, a little harder. I think the other, so far, you know, hopefully everyone's right now, as we're speaking, we're crafting your own accessibility strategies for your organizations to bring back home. Uh, creating and documenting a roadmap is, is really hard. Um, you know, even at Seamless Docs, there's auditing all of your assets. Like, that, that's daunting, right? I mean, again, I mentioned before, uh, this one particular government had 96,000 PDFs. That's just their PDFs. They also had tens of thousands of indexed websites. Don't forget about the videos and the webinars they had. So where do they even start? Right, so I think that, that uh, the interesting part about where we did is we tried to fix things like right away. Your, your instinct is this is broken, let's go fix it. When I actually think like the instinct when it comes to creating a document or, or, a, or documenting your roadmap is just starting with an audit. And then like stepping back and even letting people know that you're doing that in that nature of transparency. So I'm actually curious if anyone on the panel, have you guys uh, actually created a, a roadmap around executing either remediation? And then also how does like sustainability, how does moving forward factor in as well? So um, we're still learning. Uh, I'll just say that up front. But our report uh, from 2017 was basically a bit of a roadmap. It, it audited, you know, I had uh, audited a, a handful or a sample of websites um, in, in the report, but also we put an accessibility plan and we had goals between you know, that, that report and the report that I'm currently writing now. Some of that had very specific things like we identified issues with our template and um, we, you know, we by, 20, you know, by this report, we were, we were supposed to have resolved them, right? And some of them were like, we need a policy on video accessibility. We need a policy on plain language, things like that. So we set these goals and, you know, it, it's a learning process. So we were able to realize some of them by this report and we weren't able to realize others. And that's, that's another thing, you know, going back to transparency, just being able to communicate that, hey, we are actually putting as much resources into this and these are the goals we've been able to meet and these, these ones not so much and this is why, right? And including even like moving forward, right? So if we can't make these specific template changes for this report, what's the plan moving forward? Is that, are we transitioning into an even newer template uh, in the future or uh, will we get to it, you know, after this report? You know, just, just being kind of transparent. Yeah, really great. And I think you know, the other thing is also making sure you have the tooling to enforce moving forward. I mean, again, you know, with Seamus Docs, that it, our goal, you know, we're not a remediation company by any means, but our goal is like moving forward when you go to create that PDF, when you go to create that web form, when you go to create that online content. Uh, and there's so many aspects of what we're talking about tonight like we, we don't handle, but making sure you find a partner that makes sure that it's making it easier for you to enforce it moving forward so you're not sitting here a year from now and having to do the same thing you know, all over again. And I, I'll just say on this, for sure, 100%, you wanna have a professional audit of your site. 
uh, first and foremost. And then you can make the plan and the roadmap for what you want to do. So uh, because it can actually take years depending on the size of the teams uh, that you have in order to, to develop or, or re, you know, basically redo everything. Uh, so you want to make sure that you get a professional audit first and then from there create a roadmap that is you know, fixing the critical issues, the things that you know, people cannot, absolutely cannot even navigate on your site, that's a big problem. So fix, fix the critical issues and then go about making your roadmap address those things as, as much as you can with the staff that you have. Interesting enough, that's plan number 10, so you skipped ahead a little bit, but we'll get there in just two, uh, two more plays, guys. So, all right, number eight is engaging the accessibility community. Um, you know, this is just one that is, is so, so important. Um, there's a saying that nothing for us without us, and you know, kind of everything we've said up until now about hiring people with disabilities or you know, hiring companies and doing testing and all these other things is, you know, ultimately, if you have an accessibility policy, it's going to be so important that you're engaged in the community. You know, one of the things that I've just been so inspired uh, on this journey is how like, welcoming and excited the community has been for, um, and we really want to position ourselves as an ally to the community and how, how can we help. So in terms of engaging the accessibility community, again, I'll, I'll put this one back to Wale as well. You know, New York City, how do you engage the community, whether it be from an event or whether it's testing something? We'd love to kind of hear how, as a government, you look at engaging the community. We do that um, through, through outreach, honestly. So, like, uh, we, we know where disability organizations are. One such famous organization that a lot of blind people congregate is the Andrew Heiskell Braille and Talking Book Library. So, at least once a year, we'll organize an event there, um, maybe City Services Day and present to them about the work that we're doing. Not just digital accessibility, but we'll bring a bunch of city agencies, right? And this quickly becomes, uh, you know, a complaint form, which is fine, right? Like, we want people to be, you know, honest and tell us how they're feeling, what their frustrations are. And we've been doing this for about four years, and we get great <laughs> feedback from the community that way. There are other organizations that you can reach out to. You know, there's the National Federation of the Blind, there's the American Council of the Blind, there's Disabled in Action. So there are a lot of groups that you can reach out to, and I'm sure Thomas can tell you about an even better one. Well, I just think, you know, for me, my experience doing the meetup here in New York City for like the last several years, I mean, we're fortunate to be in New York City, you really get exposed to, you know, all types of people. So I've, I've learned a lot from organizing the meetup and just being like, well, here's a space to talk about accessibility. I think any place has that opportunity to say, hey, we want to organize an event and bring people in. Um, I could say learning to do captioning and sign language interpretation for events, that was not something I'd had experience with working in technology. But as soon as I started having the event, you know, meeting people that were deaf and hard of hearing and learning about how critical that is to a, a live event, accessibility, um, you know, I think just getting out there and, and doing and making people aware and know that you're interested in hearing from them, you, you will get responses. Um, Diversibility would be a plug here for locally. They're a Facebook group, but they are, there's a whole bunch of people there representing lots of different types of disabilities that really are always looking for opportunities to, you know, contribute more. Um, I second what they say. Baruch College as well is a good uh, resource. Yeah, oh, sorry, which college? Baruch. Uh, so there's, I think there it's are. A, a Wally's alma mater, I believe. So sad news that they're, they, closing, they're closing. But yeah. Yeah. Not they're the college, but the not computer, not the computer center for visually impaired people. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. Uh, so next play is going to be build and develop with accessibility in mind, and we put develop in there, but also build, and I, I think that that's something where. You know, I know, you know I've always been in design focused and I think that ultimately, you know, normally it, it used to be before like UX was a term, it was like, is this pretty? And it was like, oh, it's pretty and like it didn't, and then it was like, wait a minute, we should also make sure it's not just pretty, but it's usable. And then there was a lot of like structure around usability and user experience and things like material design came out and bootstrap came out that started like giving best practice when it came to usability. I think it's time that accessibility also, you know, is part of that. And I can tell you from experience that it, if you just use accessibility as a first principle and you do it first, 
I promise you it's not any more expensive to go and make sure that it's accessible after. Unfortunately, what happens is a lot of times it's an afterthought, so then you go back and you have to like go back to the building block. Or like, and again, I think just making sure you're using these resources, whether it's technical, whether it's you know, just making sure, like even like you know, putting a little sign on your desk, like is it accessible, right? And whatever you're doing, just making sure, whether it's a hiring practice, have you really thought about like, right, is this an accessible process or whether it's a technical project where are you using either a free online tester or are you reaching out to a community and asking someone or if it's a new policy, like is this accessible? So, you know, again, maybe Thomas, I know you work with a ton of different companies. Um, you know, any, any, how do you make sure that you either have like a checklist or a task force? How do you make sure when you leave an organization that you have confidence that moving forward, they're going to keep on making sure things are accessible. I uh, wish I could say I, I feel confident about them all, but um, I think it's, it's hopefully, really... Well, hopefully one company. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's why I've been, it's been great to see. Um, I think the, the, when people have that role, the, the evolution, right, the journey of, of this work, um, as I mentioned, a lot of times people's first encounter Fortunately, these days is a lawsuit, right? So they're automatically put in a reactive place of like, let me fix what just happened here. And if they just do that, it could be two months later, three months later, another lawsuit. It's like, you know, you, if you don't build this into your culture, into saying like checklists or processes, it's not going to be, um, you know, that issue's not going to go away. I guess I would say a company like Apple represents to me someone that's gotten to the the furthest point so that that would be my like in my consulting where I usually represent them as a great example of looking at something like the Apple watch which prior to that that's like a v1 product that came out that had accessibility built in considering really all types um, of people with disabilities and that's that's what you want you want your initial release the first release to be you know having all of that and so that's really the goal to get to how they got there is they have defined, like Regine said, all the roles and responsibilities, like designers are responsible for this piece, uh, content authors are responsible for this piece, and they know that it's not 65 things they need to do, it's like targeted things that they do, and they, they know that they're gonna do that every time. All right, great. Um, and then, so play number 10, as we kind of alluded, and. Uh, there's like an extra bonus play in there as well, but uh, it's just, you know, monitor continuously and test periodically. Um, so, you know, again, this is, you know, relative to your own organization needs, but I do think like monitoring continuously is going to be important. Uh, I think manual testing is going to be so, so important. Doing things like a VPAT, even like if we did at SEMA stocks, we do like a more formal audit is so, so important. But internally, like we've used tools like Site Improve and Axe and uh, use equal entry and, and a bunch of, um, where you can even have some of these automated tools. So when you create something online, it's sometimes as simple as like clicking a browser extension and like, making sure uh, something is accessible. Um, so I, I do think that's important. I mean, in terms of creating a realistic plan, I know even at Seamus Docs, we thought a lot about this. We got our VPAT done only three months ago. We made some updates. I actually went, I was like, Thomas, do we need to get another one done? Um, you know, how often do you need to be manually testing things? Is it once a year, once a quarter? What's a realistic plan? So for people in the audience thinking about creating their own plan, how often do they need to get maybe an audit? How often do they need to get manual testing? Um, and just to, to uh, decipher between the two, like an, there's some automated audits you can do through some tooling and then there's a manual audit. How often should you be doing those? I mean, it's going to be very dependent, right, on the piece of technology. Some, some sites maintain or actually keep very consistent design, and it's not about drastic changes. Some things are always iterating, constant releases. Um, you know, depending on how frequently you're fluctuating the UI, that's going to be one of the rationalizations for needing to do them more regularly is that, hey, we want to make sure that all the work we put in three months ago didn't just get wiped out with like one check-in. And I, unfortunately, that's the reality of digital compared to like physical access. You've built the elevator, you know, you get the elevator to work, it's gonna be there with digital, you know, one code check-in uh, can take that away. So I think that's, that's a part of, 
getting it built into a process, having things like the feedback form, having the automated part running in a workflow is, is very mature thing to get going where like on a content level, adding a new image onto a site, you can have things scanning that and you can say, well, we don't want to have any new image that goes up not have had a decision for alt text. So there, there are several things that can get worked into these automated processes where once you get them going, they don't happen again. And I, I say start small, like only automate like one rule. Don't turn on tons of rules. And then people say, oh, this accessibility thing's like so many rules. I'm just going to ignore them all or, or push them out. I think if you work in the ones that do work well in that automated continuous fashion, you can really start making progress and people see, oh, let's add another one after they've seen success. Let's say the image and alt text. And I'd say um, as a blanket statement, let's say you've worked on a specific product and you've made it accessible, great. Now you're going to update it, you have to also consider accessibility when you're updating. What new features are you introducing? Are these new features accessible? Um, did you introduce any new bugs? Did you break any existing accessibility? So a lot of what, what you know, Thomas has said. Um, but I also kind of want to give you a little bit of, you know, some of the stories that, that I actually experience um, in my work in terms of, they're a little bit different, you know, in terms of I'm working with a lot of different agencies, right? A lot of different organizations, not just one, unfortunately. And they all have their own resources. Some have a lot, some don't. So let's say I will work on one specific website we'll do phases, right? So once or twice a year, we'll work on it together. And in, in the phase, let's say it's phase one, uh, we're designing the website and we're gonna launch it. We're gonna hopefully cover a lot of the accessibility uh, issues, right? And we might not get to all of them. And, and this, is, you know, this is something I've experienced a lot. And if not, that's okay. You know, I will document them, I will keep them in my list. And then next time when phase two comes, We'll, get, we'll pick right back up where we left off. And that's how you know, I've had success in getting websites you know, to, to become fully accessible. And we're talking about over 300 websites um, that the city of New York either created or owns or had, you know, was created on our behalf. So um, in terms of sort of taking it in strides, right? Taking it in phases, uh, I think is, is super helpful. And just to reiterate, like again, what everyone's been saying, giving everybody their own specific role and responsibilities as it pertains to accessibility. You know, the designers need to make their colors, uh, you know, color contrast work. They're, they need to use accessible fonts, right? The content creators need to write with plain language, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah, great, and I think that uh, the, the, uh, the larger lesson, I think, is also it's ongoing. Right. We've heard it's transparency, it's ongoing. I don't think anyone here is saying you, you wave a magic wand uh, or you just throw resources at the problem. It's actually quite the opposite. You step back, take an audit, be strategic about it, and then just create a clear, a clear and transparent execution strategy uh, around how to fix it. And I think building it in. So for, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm a, a designer, so I'm gonna speak at, from a designer perspective, is when you're doing wireframes and you're annotating those wireframes, are your annotations including accessibility? Probably not, but they should be, right? And so it is making sure that people know what needs to be done, that there needs to be focus. I mean, I was on a website the other day, there was no focus and I was just trying to keyboard through and it drove me crazy. So it's, um, it's making sure that you're building it in and for those who, you know, if you're, if you're trying to incorporate accessibility into your organization and they're not really hearing it, I'm a huge fan of planting seeds. So start to plant those seeds because they eventually will grow. Absolutely. So, you know, next in terms of just the timeline of this, right, I think that, you know, I'll just talk quickly about seamless docs is, you know, first it's establishing stakeholders, right? We talked about owners, but just stakeholders in general. We talked about that a lot tonight, just sitting down and defining those, uh, creating accessibility play, but going through these steps, um, you know, finding partners. Uh, I think that's all, another thing we heard is that, you know, you don't have to do this by yourself. You can either find really great vendors or just mentors or partners. And there's also a lot of stuff online. 
Uh, partners could even be like free educational resources or a free you know, accessibility checker. Um, then also uh, is you know, execute, right? Like start putting stakes in the ground and talking about it. And then finally, it's you know, to talk about it, right? So at Seema Stocks, we publish our playbook and we're working with a lot of governments, not just to uh, go and help them with some of their forms and creating accessibility, but it's about documenting this playbook too. You know, one of the things that we're working on, and I actually almost think this is like this is kind of this is step one, right? I think you can actually go, and I I would challenge I don't maybe you wouldn't have the most complete like roadmap for example, but I think you can actually create a, a first version of your accessibility playbook in a week, right? And and document that. Now keep in mind it's going to keep on growing and you can keep on uh, adding on top of it. But that's just gonna go a long way in terms of giving you a framework that you can build on and giving you a realistic and probably even more importantly sustainable accessibility strategy going forward. So the last question, and I spent a lot of time on this, I'll, I'll talk to you, this has been over a year. What plays have we missed at SEMA Stocks? Are there any plays in creating an accessibility strategy that you think we missed? All right, I'll take that as a no. Sorry, just joking. I mean, I'll, I'll just emphasize that it's not necessarily, it's not missed, but it's not something we emphasize tonight that I, um, I see so much of the time sites are built with third party technologies. It's like not everything that you're committing to or talking about is actually stuff your organization or team is responsible for. You've procured services from, you know, something that does maybe like Zendesk does help and support pick on them because of seen them in a lot of audits, but you know, I can do something where I'm working with four or five different companies, they're all using Zendesk and they all have something built in, you know, from Zendesk that exists on all five of them. So that's why I've been excited working with Seamless Docs. They're at that central authoring layer. They fix it centrally as a platform. People can take that, put it on their site, and now they have accessibility. Um, you should really be knowing the third party stuff that's existing on your sites and making sure that you guys have real strong communications with those people that, hey, it needs to be accessible. You know, what are you doing for accessibility? Ideally, show me either a conformance statement or show me the work that you've done, like not just tell me you are, like actually be able to demonstrate it. I'm great, and thank you so much. And I will say that this is, um, uh, no, I, I, so I'll, uh, I will say this is still, this is a beta for us, right? Like, in beta, this is ongoing. It's something we're gonna continue to improve. I think 10's a nice round number, so maybe if we have to add another one, maybe we'll remove one or combine two. Uh, I think steps two and three could probably be combined. So th this is still something we're working on. Again, we, we've been relatively obsessed with this problem for over a year. We've been working with experts, but that's not to say, and I think while I even heard it, you know, we're still learning. And so again, I encourage anyone in the community, community anyone out there uh, today, you know, if you have thoughts on like, hey, what about this or, you know, um, you know, when I did this, uh, this was missing. This is what we're doing every day. And we're, so we're really excited. We're already working with governments implementing this and we're already learning on how we can make it better. So, you know, with that being said, Wale, what did I miss? Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think there's something that you missed. It's just something that I wanted to make sure that I put out there is if you plan to do business with government, you need to be accessible. Uh, more, especially here in New York City, we're taking that seriously. In the procurement co contracts now, we're requiring accessibility. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, also, like Thomas said, don't buy inaccessible tools. Don't, you know, whether it's your content management systems or your timesheet logging system or whatever it is, stop investing money into inaccessible tools because it will come around and it will you know, you will regret it at some point or another, whether it's when you hire a person with a disability or when you want to do business, you know, with, with government or any other organizations. And my final thought to you guys, sorry, is how many, how many folks took the elevator to get here today? Say aye. Aye. All right. How many folks, <laughs> and how many folks have ever changed the brightness on their screens? How many folks have ever enlarged text? Uh, How many folks have ever used captions when they couldn't hear the videos? Uh, Accessibility is for everyone, guys. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think it's uh, it's time we all start making access for all. So, um, 
Again, I do, I think we still have a little time. It is uh, 8.26 and I think um, that was, we're actually kind of on schedule. Uh, I think we're supposed to be until 8.30 and we wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Um, so, uh, you know, with that being said, again, uh, first of all, let's give a round of applause for the panelists. Uh, and I guess, you know, so with that being said, does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, can you, do you have any of those terribly accessible sites that you, that people do not really go to? Do you have some sort of samples? I mean, I think it's the World Wide Web, unfortunately. Um, Wikipedia knows. I, do you I mean don't know. an example website or what? Are we doing like accessibility <laughs> shaming right now? Is that what's going on? <laughs> Wait, good ones or bad ones? I don't know. There's, there's, if you want to know more about what's accessible and what's not, uh, webaim.org did, um, they looked at a million of the top websites uh, out there to see who was accessible and who wasn't. And there's some good results in there. So I think webaim.org, take a look at the, the, the top million websites. Uh, out there and see what what the what their results say. That will give you a. It's not so much a ranking, but it will, it'll give you information on what what is going on, and, and let you know. So, yeah. so I think for me, I mean, I almost again I'm thinking about 20 years ago when I went to a favorite website and it wasn't mobile friendly, and I think that's where we are. I don't, I don't at least not yet. I don't, I don't really blame them. I, I, who, what my biggest pet peeves are. When I go to a website and it claims to be accessibility or the amount of accessibility consulting websites, you know, and like they're not fully accessible, or, or when you go to a, a website that says their accessibility page for a government and it like doesn't have any contact information or, I think that's, that to me is almost a bigger pet peeve, right? It's, and again, one of the reasons why we came out with the Alley Bar and the accessibility portal, we wanted to kind of at least give people an easy way just to do that, just to get in touch. So. so. Yeah, so the question is, uh, why, did, why did we create seamless docs? And what do I mean by out of the box? Um, so, compliant with what? Compliant with, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so seamless docs was we created about six, seven years ago. Um, at this point, you know, we've been lucky enough to raise like 20 or so million dollars. We're considered something called GovTech, which means a software as a service uh, built specifically for governments. Um, a quick aside there, I do personally believe there's going to be a new burgeoning uh, market which is called access tech for people that are building technology just for accessibility and I do believe there should be some, hopefully some venture backing and investment going to that. Uh, in terms of out of the box and compliance, um, you know, that, that is, uh, to answer that question, I mean there's so many different parts of our platform but I mean, and to give you a real answer, you, you can look at our VPAT and we like list out it for the service center and our web forms. But essentially what that means for us and out of the box is that we're a platform. So we allow you tools to be able to build web forms or build online documents or build a service center. Uh, and you don't have to have a technical background to do it. All of our tools are drag and drop or like point and click. Our goal is that anything you build using our platform will automatically have those features. So, and our compliance standard is similar. It's WCAG 2.0 currently. Uh, but what's really cool about having a platform is that once we become 2.1, guess what, like all, of your, like all of the forms that we ever created will also automatically be compliant as well. So um, the other thing, just a quick a distinction, is between accessible and compliant. Like, there are many platforms that are accessible, which means they allow you to do that. Um, our goal is to go one step further, and we want to be a compliance platform more than an accessible platform. That's, like our, that's our goal, and that's kind of where we're going to. And again, what that means is that we want to make sure that you can't build anything on our platform that's not accessible. Like now, it's interesting, going back to the design question you asked, there's limitations that we're going to have to enforce. We're not going to allow people to choose font colors. You, right? Like think about that, right? Like we're, we're going to say that, or if you do, we're going to require that the certain contrast be, so you're not going to be able to choose light gray in seamless docs for a font. Right? So I think that, that's something that's, that's, a, that's a big decision for an editor tool, right? So that's, that's what we mean by out of the box and compliant. Yep. Um, so you had mentioned that you were using Ally Bar to collect uh, analytics as well. Um, I know that some analytics are gonna be really hard to collect, like if we're using a screen reader, both for privacy issues as well as technical. Um, can you talk more about what analytics you are collecting and why and how? 
Yeah, so j just to specify, so great question. The question was, we're using Alibar to co collect some analytics. Uh, <clears throat> and what specific analytics are we doing? Um, you know, a very relevant one would be, like, are, is someone using a screen reader or assisted device? Um, or are they like, even, are they using their high contrast, whatever it might be? Um, that's a really great question and a really awesome thing that we should probably incorporate for like V2 and, or V3. Um, currently our, our analytics, this is literally launched today, uh, currently our analytics are limited to how many times you're using the actual bar. So we're starting with, are people actually using it? Uh, a quick distinction too from the Alley bar versus a lot of other uh, feedback bars is that our bar is initiated first on tab. So if you load a, new, if you load a website, and you press tab, it automatically instantiates the alley bar and allows you to skip to main first. You press tab again, and it will go to feedback, and skip it again, accessibility, and then it'll bring you into the website. Um, again, it's a little bit different than some other experiences. You have to maybe click a floating icon that may or may not be distinguishable. So our goal there is just, are people using it? Right? And then if they're using it, then how they're using it? But I, I love that idea. I think that's, that's really cool to start thinking about instead of just collecting, we are automatically collecting what browser they're using and what OS they're using. It'd be really cool to understand, are they, are they engaging with this via a screen reader or in a certain mode, would help us understand how to better use it. So, great question. So I'll let Regine take that one. Um, I'm just going to repeat the question real quick to make sure everyone can hear it. So the question was, uh, she was an e-commerce designer um, for uh, usability or user experience. Uh, how do you, when the design process which involves like wireframes and has so many different steps in it, how do you bake in accessibility from the get-go? So, you know, everybody's talking, not everybody, but a lot of people in the design world are talking about design systems. and. I would say incorporating accessibility into the design system is super helpful in, in order to get accessibility on the site eventually, right? But it also takes people having knowledge of what that means. And a lot of, frankly, a lot of designers don't know about accessibility or they don't think it's important, right? Because they just don't know any better. And when you know better, you do better. So I would say, one, it's the education of what, from a design perspective, do I need to do to make this accessible? Two, how am I communicating that to the dev team, right? And then how can we get that on the site and then test it and make sure that what we, what we want is what's out there so that everyone can use it. But it definitely needs to be incorporated and weaved into the, into the design system. And then I would say commitment. I mean, I mean, Charlie, again, I'll call him out, he's here. Um, he built a beautiful landing page for A11 bar.com and I think what's so cool about it it's so simple like it, it's like a, it was like a simple design and like who doesn't like simple design yet like well, this is a good example of accessibility turning into something beautiful and then the second piece is commitment I will say implementing this in an organization like you know we're again almost 45 people and implementing with a team of engineers and team of designers the amount of pushback that you'll get initially I mean it's real uh, you know if you're an e-commerce company and just saying no like we're committed to this, like we have to do this. I don't care if it takes longer. I don't care if we have to go to another design. I think that that's, that conviction is gonna be so, so important from the beginning because it, it will take longer and this is a learning lesson. I mean, we're still learning about, you know, when do you add like, you know, an ARIA labels, but even in the wireframe stage, it's like, all right, well, how can you start incorporating accessibility then? So having that conviction. And also just to add that third party thing in there too. Say you're using Envision or, one of the wireframing apps. Hey, like, how? What are you guys doing for accessibility? How do I get a wireframe that's successful? You know, it's going, it's evolving, and that is things that I'm seeing progress being made on. But that's been a barrier, right? Of like, how do you participate, or maybe have people with disabilities participating more even in the wireframe process? Well, companies like Envision need to be thinking about that, designing for that. Yeah. You know, so, get the question. I would say just also personally, just being a designer, and. This is just some like, real lessons we've learned is studying colors when it comes to accessibility. I mean, there, it's, it will drive you mad because I th even things 
thinking like the contrast ratios and like different font size and contrast ratios of colors. Like I cannot tell you how many times you'll make that mistake and you'll have to go back and I'll go back to Charlie and be like, it's not dark enough. And he's like, it's dark enough. I'm like, it's not dark enough. Uh, yeah, you, that size is real. Um, so I think just understanding those colors initially. So I, as, a, as a designer, I think it's up to you to start the basic principles, understanding what those are, like around the colors, around background ratios, things like that. That will just make you so much more powerful as you go into the process. So it's almost like powering yourself for, sorry. That was like a, that's a, that's a question I could talk a lot about. So um, awesome. So I think I saw a couple more other questions. Uh, yeah, I am an engineer, um, not an expert in accessibility, but I care a lot about it. Um, but you love everybody. <laughs> I, do you have any suggestions for how to actually get leadership to buy in? Um, I'm basically in the example that, well, like, I'm entry level. Um, I'm also probably the most experienced in accessibility, and I've just had such a hard time getting people to care. Data is your friend, um, in, in my opinion. Data will help you. Um, relay that information and as I said earlier planting seeds because when you're in an organization that doesn't really fully believe in it or know why it's important yet um, they soon will right one way or another and so I think it's one coming up with the data saying okay we can actually increase our search engine optimization if we have XYZ like you know there are certain things that you can bring in data and explain that and then hopefully Again, you know, planting the seeds will help deliver that message, but I'm sure these two have some other suggestions. So I think organizations take things seriously and or like <coughs> react to things that have a public nature to them. So you didn't hear this from me, but you know, you might want to ask one of your friends to maybe tweet at your organization. Um, you know, uh, this is being taped. <laughs> I've never done such things, but I'm just saying, you know, these are strategies I've time. heard. Of. <laughs> these are things I've heard of. Um, and, but like, no, but, but for real, you know, I, I, you know, working in my capacity, a complaint has gone a long way. And, and it's not that, that I'm actually like covertly sending messages to people, but when somebody happens to submit a complaint, whether it's through our form or through publicly on Twitter calling us out, that's more likely to get leadership support than me, you know, asking them nicely. Um, the other, the, the other sort of uh, thing I will sort of try to, to kind of like big piggyback off the data um, argument, just try to have that positive approach. Like we can actually increase our business by this much. We could be reaching a wider audience. Um, you know, and, and it's not just about those customers, right? It's those customers and the people that they're bringing with them, right? If, if you got me as a new customer, I'm not, I'm not coming alone. I'm bringing my friends. I'm bringing my family members. I, you know, I might bring my work colleagues. So it, it you know, there's, there's also, there's always that, that argument as well. So, so a couple of things there. I mean, I think there's no shortage of reasons to go accessible, right? I mean, there's. One is procurement. Like while I said, if you want to work with government, if you want to start, start working, these dominoes just got a huge lawsuit. So you want to start working with any of these large companies, you need to be accessible, so procurement. Number two is legal. This is the law, right? So I think it's just, you, there's a liability that if you continue to ignore it. Uh, there's also, this is like the right thing to do, right? Uh, and then finally, this is like, you're, you're actually omitting or excluding 20% you know, of the population or sometimes more, or depending on, on your target market. And then one thing I'll say to you, I'd be interested if, if you were, is I'd even help you craft a letter to your management and that's something maybe we can build together and we can kind of open source and provide. And like, I think it's, it's just, it's sad to me that that's something you worry about because it's, it's like, why wouldn't you enable that? Now, at the same time, I'm, I can also bring you like the CEO perspective, right? We took, it took us, you know, some of the things we might've been able to do in a month, maybe it took us three months to be honest. And the reason why was because we had a roadmap and we had other things that we were doing. So it's just, it's understanding where they're coming from also. Like I get that you need to get this new launch up, but like maybe explaining how can we, maybe we can make a baby step or maybe we can include this in the beginning. So, I mean, I think that's something that would be a worthy cause. So if you were interested, I would love to kind of work with you on crafting a letter towards management on, on, on driving buy-in. I mean, we sell to government. 
you know, people said that that was not possible when we first started doing it. Uh, I think this is a way easier sell. Anyone else? Yep, sir. Yeah, Apple TV has voiceover control and captions for videos. Do you see that as a trend for your next stand that they will require that all videos and audio voiceover controls be available to user on website? Accessibility is going to be a trend. Uh, it, 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 it already is. Uh, in part, we are 16 short years away from having more old people than young in this country. Well, well, sorry, what so was that? That's in 2035, we will have more old people in this country than young people. So what happens when you get old? And what I like to tell my students and other people is like, if we're not designing things for our older selves, what the hell are we doing, right? And so it's not only thinking about the people now, but thinking about, again, we all think about ourselves. Uh, some people don't, <laughs> but most of us think about ourselves. So we wanna be able to use these products in the future. Why, why aren't we doing that, you know? Uh, why aren't we making these things for our future selves now? Because we're gonna, it's going to be very interesting time to see what happens. Yep. And I think one more interesting like, uh, example of an opportunity around access tech or around these things, but also an opportunity around just building something that's, that's better for everybody, right? Like if you can create more accessible videos that maybe have subtitles, but it's not just about that. I mean, we were, Motorola is one of our investors, and they're obsessed with this problem because they have all this like, camera-worn footage, right? So how do they, in that, how do they get that? get the actual audio description and index it so they can find out when something's happening. There's also the, the FCC has the Communications and Video Accessibility Act, which was more, one of the more recent laws um, in the U.S. That it's, law actually, Tom is the best. <laughs> <laughs> that law has teeth in it too, where you actually get fined daily when you're out of compliance, which is something more unique to that one. So I, I mean, that's been a big motivator <laughs> for people that are making these video display and communication devices, there's another law that's kind of involved in that too. Charlie? Yes. And then, sorry, just, and then we're going to take one more question after that. So uh, if you have a good one, just raise your hand uh, a high after this one. So yes, Charlie? So it's, it's, uh, it's an extension to the question that the gentleman posed here. So for me, like one of the most obvious like um, uh, shortcomings, for example, is like movie theaters, right? Like they, how does the regular um, viewer of the movie They don't have any kind of like accessible technology or anything like that. Do you, a lot do you of them do, actually. A lot of them do, do, yeah. That's yeah, a... but like, do you, see, do you see that becoming like the standard, for example? Of Just course. a quick question. Quickly, he's asked about accessibility in movie theaters in certain areas, and then, sorry. They do have, um, they do have accessibility in movie theaters, a majority of them, because people who, um, you know, are hard of hearing, there's, there are devices. There, those have work to do as well. Um, but we do have to think about entertainment, right? Uh, entertainment, because that's what a lot of uh, accessibility, when we think about accessibility, it is oftentimes associated with uh, entertainment. But I do see growth in that area just because of the way that we are. We're constantly looking at screens. Low vision is on the rise. Uh, so there are just things that we, we need to build. Agreed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as a person who, you know, makes use of audio descriptions, I'd say 10 years ago when I would go to movie theaters and ask for these devices, they'd give me the one for the opposite um, disability. So like I would be like, I'm blind. And they're like, OK, we're just going to make the volume louder for you. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that actually in the last three or four years, my experience going to movie theaters has been the opposite. Uh, there are hiccups, of course, but uh, generally where I, where I go to movie theaters, uh, as long as they're maybe like, you know, a, big enough or, and not like a small business, um, they, they do have um, headsets for people who have hearing disabilities and also headsets for folks who are blind that have audio description. And I was actually just in Kansas City. And I can confirm that I went to a movie theater there and they had audio description and, and, and it worked. Like Broadway plays and, and yes, here in New York City, yeah. if you'd like to hear, actually, we've been actually done some really cool stuff. Um, or not us, but you know, we, we know about programs that we promote 
through Schubert's theaters and, and uh, Majestic Theater, um, a lot of the live performances will either have a live audio describer or they've actually built this really cool technology that uses artificial intelligence and voice recognition to sync up the audio description, a recorded audio description with the live performance. So amazing. So I think we're getting the, the Grammy music is going on. Um, you know, I will just want to thank once again uh, the panelists um, and then everyone else for just being here. I mean, I definitely think that like, the best cure to any problem is just starting that conversation and being here. So again, I, I thank everyone so much for being here. Uh, I can say that hopefully this was simple and accessible uh, because this is something that we have spent an exorbitant amount of time and a lot of resource putting into and it's going to kind of been our own journey. So hopefully everyone here has enjoyed it. Uh, we'd love to continue the conversation. Um, we can probably distribute the conversation with Regine, Thomas, and Wale potentially. Uh, but there's, there's mine. I'm just J-E at SEMA Stocks. If anyone has any questions or wants to continue this conversation, we'd love to. As you guys have feedback about any of the things we talked about today, whether it's the playbook, whether it's the alley bar, whether it's accessibility portal, this is a conversation we're obviously incredibly passionate about. I just, I am, today is just, I, I feel very just, just proud today on a personal level just because this is something that we set out and committed to. And I, I just really, I, I never thought I would enjoy it so much. And I, again, I could encourage everyone here, whether you're working for your own company or another company, um, to take this journey as well. Uh, and all of us can definitely push this forward and make accessibility for all the standards. So thank you guys so much for coming.